Hey, welcome back to YouTube. Uh, this is the next in the series of videos on woodlot management. It is December 31st, 2022. Where has the year gone? I'm here on one of our properties, and uh, as you can see, we don't have a lot of snow, probably, probably two inches in the sheltered areas. Very, very strange for this time of year in this part of New Brunswick. Uh, temperatures today are uh, about 35 degrees on the Fahrenheit side. Temperatures are forecast tomorrow and the next day to be up uh, 45, 50 degrees. That is, that's unheard of in the past here in New Brunswick. Uh, usually this time of year in January, we're at minus 20, minus 30. A couple of feet of snow in the woods. But we're not having climate change or global warming. <laughs> okay, so the subject of today's video is roads. Uh, it don't matter how good of a property you have or how big of a property or or anything like that. If you don't have good access roads, all you've got is a tax bill and a headache. And uh, so roads, roads are critical to the use and the enjoyment of a woodlot. Uh, there's a number of different types of roads. Now, if we look at this historically, I mean, New Brunswick has been a, a timber producing province for as long as we've been here. This was uh, originally called Acadia back in the days of the, uh, the French ownership of the eastern part of Canada. Then it was called Nova Scotia, and then they split the two provinces, and we have Nova Scotia and New Brunswick today. New Brunswick, especially the Miramichi River Valley here, was a source of uh, mass timbers and uh, lumber for the shipbuilding industry. In fact, our first uh, major settler here was William Davidson, who was granted 100,000 acres down at the mouth of the river by the Crown for the purpose of developing shipbuilding industry. Of course, back in the late 1700s into the early 1800s with the wars in Europe, uh, the timber industry in eastern Canada became very important because the supply of timbers for the British Royal Navy was being choked off by uh, various world powers at the time in Europe. The Napoleon was, uh, he was cutting off their supply from the Baltic regions and uh, so eastern Canada really opened up as, as a source for lumber, especially uh, white pine for ship mass. And so the lumber industry went from there and flourished. And then as they laid off private ground, uh, it, it was a source of income for every landowner. And so the first roads that we've seen in these, these areas would have been the tote roads. And uh, tote road was really just, just a way to transport goods from one point to another. Uh, tote road, uh, usually wasn't improved very well. It was just enough to get a wagon or a sled, or sometimes in the summertime they'd use drags, just a heavy type of sled affair that they could pull along behind a team of horses. And a tote road just got you from point A to point B. Uh, if you've ever driven down a country road, especially back roads, and you wonder why in the world is this road so twisty and turny, uh, chances are the government just improved on an old tote road. Tote roads, the reason that they were often quite crooked and whatnot is that uh, if they came to a big tree, rather than try and cut the tree out and dig the stump up, they drove around the tree. If they came to a big rock or a cradle knoll, they drove around it instead of improving it. And then as the county and then the provincial government took uh, control of a lot of these roads in the colony, they simply improved on the existing roads. And so the tote roads, to achieve a tote road, all that they did was cut trees out of the road. They looked for the easiest point of uh, passage, you know, the path of least resistance. They cut the trees out of the way. They cleared what rocks and, uh, and uh, deadfalls and stuff that they absolutely had to move in order to get a wagon through. And that was it. And uh, stumps were left to rot out. Eventually they did. Sled roads were, uh, for the winter logging operations, a sled road wasn't even as good usually as a tote road because 
with the sled roads, they would cut them and uh, cradle knolls. When I say cradle knoll, I'm talking where you get two, two humps of ground and you've got a low place in between them. They would, uh, they would cut the trees and the brush and they'd pile it into the, the low place. And then when winter come and they were starting to sled, the snow levels everything out. And you can have a beautiful sled road in the winter that's nice and smooth and you can travel on it as good as can be. And then when the snow melts in the spring, you look at it and you think, did I actually drive over that in the winter? And uh, so sled roads were, uh, were not well improved. They served the purpose to run logging sleds and supply sleds when there was two, three, four feet of snow in the woods. And uh, then in the summertime, the sled roads were uh, almost impassable. Eventually, the stumps and brush would rot out, and uh, sometimes these roads would be improved somewhat, sometimes they weren't. The next step up from uh, Tote Road was a trench road, and this is what you can see here behind me. Now a trench road is probably common if you've got a, a woodlot or an older property. Uh, trench roads were made simply by running a bullnoser through the woods. And a tote road or a sled road could be improved with a bullnoser. The bullnoser leveled the road bed, took the stumps out, but unfortunately it dug a trench down. So your road bed was actually lower than the ground on either side of you. And uh, trench roads are good. All of the roads that I have on my woodlots here are trench roads. Uh, we used to sell all of our lumber to one particular sawmill. It was a family owned sawmill downriver from us. And uh, the owners of that sawmill, if you had some logs to sell and you needed a road fixed or a new section of road built, they would send the company bulldozer in and they would uh, build the road for you. All you had to do was have it cut out and uh, the logs taken off the sides of the road. They'd send the bullnoser in and bullnose the road out for you and uh, then just take the price of the bullnosing off the top of the logs that you had to sell. It was a good arrangement. The new owner's large industrial company has that sawmill now. They won't offer that option to landowners anymore. Building a road is uh, it's a costly business today, uh, a lot more so than what it was like when I was 20 or 30 years old. It's... Uh, it's costly to bring heavy machinery in and, and build a road. And so if there's any way that you can uh, improve on your roads by yourself, if you have a farm tractor and you can, uh, you can do some work onto it, you're a, a better, better off. Uh, the trench roads had advantages that they were cheap and quick to build, but they also had disadvantages. If you have, uh, if you have a wet place on your woodlot, uh, water is going to collect on a trench road. If the, uh, if the ground is not well drained, you're going to get big water holes. Water holes create mud puddles and mud puddles soften the road bed up and then you've got a bigger mud puddle and then you've got a place that you can get a truck stuck. And so uh, drainage is one issue on trench roads. Uh, the old trench roads tended to be narrow. Now, if you see behind me, this road is probably 12, 12 to 14 feet wide. Uh, trench roads were necessary with logging operations when horses were used. Uh, the reason I say that is if you look at any of the modern roads that are built today by industrial forestry, they bring in an excavator and they elevate the roadbed and they raise it up so that uh, there's drainage, which is good for tractor trailers ripping through. These roads here that I've got, uh, we always hauled off these with tandem trucks and uh, tandem trucks with a self-loader and uh, a tandem truck can navigate these roads easily but because these roads were built on old tote roads, uh, you're not going to take a tractor trailer on most of the roads that I have here and uh, that's, that's the story with a lot of private properties. Uh, the roads just won't accommodate a tractor trailer. It needs some machine work done to get tractor trailers in. With the new industrial roads, what they do, they elevate the road bed, they make roads that are, you know, straight as an arrow for, oh, my buddy's helping me out here. Roads that are straight as an arrow for, you know, five, 10 miles, and they can easily run tractor trailers on them. 
and uh, but the flip side of that is it cost a lot of dollars to build a road like that. Now, when I say that trench roads were necessary with horse logging, when you were horse logging, you had to have block trees on the side of your road in order to build the, the yard of logs, to pile the logs as you brought them out. So you needed trees that were within 16 feet of the side of the road because you never built a yard over 16 feet. Anything over 16 feet was too hard for the loader on the truck to reach in and get a hold of the logs. And so with these trench roads, it left enough standing timber along the sides of the roads. You could have your block trees and uh, your yard tree. You could easily pile the logs up. You could pile your pulpwood right along the shoulder of the road and it made it so that the trucks could easily load. If you've ever looked at the new uh, industrial roads that they have, you've got uh, you know, 20, 20, 30 feet from the edge of the road to the nearest tree before they clear cut it and knock all the trees down anyway. But uh, there's no chance on the new industrial roads. My dog is going absolutely crazy. <laughs> there's no chance on the new industrial roads to uh, put up a yard of logs. Uh, it's been tried a few times. I know of a couple of operations in this area that uh, they went in and they tried to take uh, logs out with horses on the, the new type of roads and it's it ends up being a disaster because there's no way to pile safely and easily with the horses and uh, yeah it just winds up it don't work so that is the story on uh, on trench roads now with these roads here I don't know if you can see it too easily but just behind me here on this side there's a little bit of a low place right here on the road and behind on this side They've dug down in with the bulldozer and a little bit on the other side of the road here. That's the way that they achieved drainage on these roads if you had a low place. What we got right here, and I don't know if it's too evident with the uh, camera, there's a long grade coming down and then the knoll goes up going away from the, where the, the ATV is parked here right now. So this low place in the road creates a place that water could collect. And where water collects, like I say, it softens your road. So what they would do when they built these uh, trench roads is they would take the bulldozer every so far and they'd just dig a low place off the side of the road. They're in there probably, well, probably 16, 18 feet on both sides of the road. They're kind of growing in with trees a little bit here now, but it achieves a lower place so that the water drains off of the sides of the road. That's another aspect. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the term corduroy roads. Sometimes when roads crossed very swampy ground, they would uh, build what they called a corduroy road, where they would level the roadbed out the best that they could, and then they laid logs, usually cedar logs, crossways in the road. And they would build, they would build a roadbed that looked like this here. It was, you know, logs laid side by side, and then they'd put a little bit of dirt over the top of that, and those logs would gradually sink into the muddy section, but it would stiffen the roadbed up enough so that uh, sleds, trucks, whatever, could pass over it. Uh, not the best solution if you're trying to run a tractor trailer over it, of course, but the older trucks, like when they, when they first started using trucks in this section of the woods, it was three-ton trucks, and they'd come in and load the pulpwood uh, by hand, and then... Uh, they, they started with some of the old side sidearm loaders that brought the logs up and dumped them in on the truck this way. Sidearm loaders on the, on a truck was, they were extremely dangerous. But uh, it was small trucks when they first started on these roads and then they went with the bigger tandems that would be the equivalent of what you see for the dump trucks now and whatnot, but uh, they would put the self loader on them. But a, a three ton truck could handle a corduroy road usually uh, you know, a tandem log and truck could handle a uh, corduroy road, but anything bigger than that would, uh, they would tend to break down. It's funny, I actually know of a place uh, just outside of the capital city of Fredericton. There's a road there that, uh, when I was younger, it was, there was just a few scattered houses on that road, and that road is built up now. There's, it's just subdivision after subdivision. But I can actually remember when the, uh, the chip seal, the asphalt on that road, you could still see the old corduroy road uh, coming up through the, the chip seal and the asphalt in a couple of places on that road, the Clarney Road outside of Fredericton.
and the, the road, of course, it's been built up quite a bit now, but that was uh, originally an old tote road through, uh, through a swampy place, and they had laid the corduroy, and then the government just built the asphalt road over the top of it. But that, was, uh, that was one way of handling, handling wet places on the road, achieving drainage. Like I say, these little little side pockets here that they used to put off the roads. Uh, now this particular road here, of course, some of the very earliest roads in New Brunswick, uh, they follow they fall portage roads. And uh, this road here is actually, if you talk to any of the old timers around here, this is called Portage. Now Portage was kind of a mispronunciation of portage or portage in French, and uh, the portage roads were uh, built on trails that connected uh, different river systems. And this particular road here connected the Miramichi River, which is south of us, with the Dungarvan and the Renews River, which is north of us. And this, uh, so the, the earliest maps that I've seen of New Brunswick, uh, I have a couple of books. One was uh, compiled by William F. Ganong, and uh, he detailed a lot of the Indian trails, the Indian portages. And uh, this this road is actually on in his book in some of his earliest maps that he, he drew up back in the 1800s. But I've seen maps back as early as uh, uh, the late 1700s that has this particular portage trail marked on it. Now, the reason for this portage trail was that if we go south of here about a half mile, there's a deep hollow that cuts down out of the hills. And the entire north side of the Miramichi River here for, oh, 15, 20 mile, the entire north side of the Miramichi Valley is a very steep ridge, steep, rocky, uh, 75 to 85 degree grade in places. And there's only a few places that you could get up through that ridge. And uh, the hollow out here at the mouth of this one and the hollow that my farm is built in are two of the places that you could actually get from the river valley up over the ridge easily if you were pulling, you know, a sled or, or uh, you know, traveling with children, women, seniors, whatever, that the natives might have been traveling. It was an easy point of access from the river valley into the highlands. And once they hit the highlands, this trail goes back. It goes north of here about uh, two, two and a half mile. And then it forked. And the east branch of that trail went northeast to uh, down in the Bartholomew's River drainage. And the uh, western fork of that trail went uh, up through Porter Brook headwaters and on to the Dungarvan River. And of course, north of the Dungarvan is the Renews. Major waterways for the natives back in the, the you know, the time pre-colony. And uh, so this road was, it was frequented and traveled by natives and it was, uh, it was a well marked out and well beat down trail. And so when the uh, colonists come along, they decided that, hey, you know, there's an existing trail that travels from one river to another river, let's use this trail. And so eventually the road was improved and uh, built up and used for uh, a good many years. I would, uh, you'd think I was lying if I told you how many hundred thousand dollars worth of timber that I know of that traveled on this, this road right here on the backs of trucks. But uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of travel on this road. It was actually used uh, by the government a couple of times uh, my grandfather and my father done statutory labor on this road back in the back in the old days. Uh, you could opt to do so much labor on the roads as uh, a portion of paying your land taxes. And the government used to do statutory labor on this road. There was a few times that floods cut off the highway south of here that runs down past my farm, and they actually brought the school bus back here plowed the road out with a bulldozer and brought the school bus back because the kids were stranded at the school up in Boystown and uh, the only way to get into the settlement of Priceville, which is down east of us, was to travel through the woods here. 
So this road has seen a lot of use. As a matter of fact, uh, William F. Ganong, if anybody of you are familiar with his writings, a uh, member of the Ganong family from St. Stephen that has the candy factory. Uh, Ganong was a geologist. He was uh, in, into cartography and, and the study of uh, natural history of New Brunswick. William F. Ganong, on his last trip to the Dungarvan River, traveled this road. He came to Boystown, got off the train, came by wagon down, and this was the trail that he would have taken into the Dungarvan River country. So, uh, quite a bit of history right here on this uh, particular stretch of road. Now, I'm going to I'm going to shut the camera down here for a minute. We're going to jump on the ATV and we're going to go back the road here a bit. There's another feature back here that I want to show you next. Okay, so here we are. We're on another branch. This branch is off of the Portash Road. And this is what the old timers called the Bark Road. Now, the reason for that was this road goes northwest into... Uh, what used to be a big stand. Yes, hello, you're on camera. Okay, go do your thing. No, don't touch the camera. No, 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 you're okay. Go lay down. Yes, okay, that's Gaia. Gaia is, uh, she's about nine months old and she is just a bundle of energy. She's a great Pyrenees and uh, she's quite a handful. Okay, getting back to the road. This road was called the Bark Road. It goes northwest. Uh, off of the private land, it goes up onto the crown land, and uh, it went up into a big hemlock forest. And uh, hemlock, if any of you know, is not the best of uh, construction lumber. Hemlock is very splintery when it dries. If you've ever worked around an old house or an old building that was built with uh, hemlock lumber, you get a splinter in your hands off it very easily, and the splinter gets infected because of the oil content in the wood. Hemlock served its purpose for uh, fencing and uh, sills on buildings. Quite often they'd use hemlock for sills on barns or houses because where the oil content into it, when it's down close to uh, the ground, the moisture doesn't affect it as much. Now the hemlock forest that was back here, the snow is a little bit cold on the knees. The hemlock forest that was back here, uh, they harvested it solely for the bark. Now, what they would do is they'd go in in the summertime when the bark would slip easily off the trees and uh, they cut the hemlock, they junked them up enough so that they was manageable, you know, they were able to roll them around and move them to peel them. They would peel the trees with bark spuds and stack the sheets of bark and then wait until winter time came and once winter time came they could come in with the sleds, they'd build wide 12 foot uh, racks on the sleds and they'd pile the bark as high as they could because the bark of course not being heavy like logs horses could haul uh, quite a large load of it and so they'd pile the the bark as high as they could on the sleds and haul it out get it to the uh, uh, sidings along the railway and load it into box cars and the bark is used for tanning le leather there's a high tannin content in the oil of the bark, and it gives uh, leather a deep, rich red color. And so that was a market that they had back in those days, back in the days of horses and uh, harness. That was a market that they had for the hemlock lumber that otherwise didn't have the value of like spruce or pine would have as far as lumber went. And so, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate thing looking back at it uh, from our viewpoint that those trees were cut down and left there to rot in the woods but on the flip side of the coin cutting them down allowed uh, more valuable species like the spruce and pine to root and uh, come up and grow. If you've ever been into uh, into a section of woods where there's a lot of hemlock uh, one thing you'll notice is that the ground is almost bare between them. The Needles from hemlock have a tendency to substantially stunt the growth of small trees. And uh, so by taking the hemlock out, they opened up the woods for other trees to grow. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. But the lumber wasn't, the lumber wasn't considered valuable as lumber. It wasn't something you sawed boards and uh, framing lumber out of because of the brittleness and the splinters. 
Now I'm going to move the camera right over here and we're going to look at uh, one aspect of something that I wanted you to see here on the road. Now if we look at this tree, and uh, hopefully the camera can focus in here without it getting too wobbly. Got a, one of these sticks here that's supposed to be able to gimbal stabilizers. But if you look at this, you can see that there's actually, there's actually axe marks here in the wood. Now there was a reason for that. Now this, the tree here has rotted out over the years and the porcupines took up nesting inside it. Not so many porcupines around here now, but porcupines and uh, pine marten. But if you look real closely here, you can see that this was actually chopped out. And you can see, you can see chopping marks back in here. The side of this tree was all chopped out. And now if we walk right over here, We can see the same thing on this one. Now hopefully there's enough light. We can see that this, this is all chopped out in here. Now the reason for that was when they were coming in here with the sleds, get back out through the trees here, when they were coming in through here with the sleds, and like I said they used very wide racks on the sleds, they actually had a, a turning place here so that when one sled was coming in the other sled could pull off and pass by and so what happened here get our camera placed again here in the snow so what happened here was that in order to make a place that the sleds could pass by with these wide racks they actually chopped a notch in this tree because it was so close to the side of the road that when the sleds were coming by they were they would catch again the side of this tree and then the one across the road that's where they were pulling the sleds off to make room for the other sleds to pass and so when the sleds over there pulled off the road because there was some big spruce in behind it they had to notch the side of that tree in order for the racks to pass by so it's just kind of a unique thing I mean these notches were made in this tree over a hundred years ago and this tree is still growing. I mean it's grown out over the notches and you know when the tree was notched it wouldn't have been that big a tree but it was on private land and so they didn't actually cut the tree down but they notched the tree to give access for the, the sleds to pass by and uh, so I, I've I've left the tree standing just you know for that historic value that you can actually see where they've see where they've notched the tree out here and you can see the axe marks and you know 100, 100 plus years later it's still standing you know even though the the core of the tree and that's one of the things about hemlock the inside of a hemlock tree will completely rot away but the outside wood is still living and so the tree remains standing and keeps on growing for you know I don't know how many how many hundred years old some of these trees here would be but uh, just a unique thing that I want you to see it's uh, you know, one of the, the strange things, there's some different trees around through my lot here. And over the course of doing these videos on woodlot management, I'm going to show you some of the uh, some of the really unique features that you can find in old growth woods or mixed stand woods like this. That, uh, you know, a tree like this here in industrial forestry, they would drop this and knock it down so that they could plant a new spruce seedling beside it. But, uh, hey, this is history, you know. Leave this one standing and let it be the same way with that one across the road there. They don't have to fall, so let them stand, let them be. So, I hope this has been informative. Uh, back on the subject of roads, if you're... My glove froze to the ground. If you're building roads, one of the things that you've got to look for, or that you've got to keep in mind, is access for your machinery and access for trucks. So if you're putting a new road in, uh, 
bear in mind, number one, the size of the truck that's going to be taking your product out. Are you going in just with personal vehicle for personal enjoyment of the property? Are you going in with farm tractors that are easy to turn? Or are you going in with tandem trucks to take out logs, pulpwood, you know, saleable product? Or are you going to be taking in a tractor trailer? Now, industrial forestry, like I said, they build the big elevated roads. Uh, the company that owns all the crown land or operates all the crown land around here, they, uh, they actually gave me a price a few years ago on cutting this lot and another lot that I have west of here. And uh, included in the price was uh, uh, the cost of building a road into my property. Now, the funny part is, if, you, if we walked off to the left here about uh, 200 meters, there's a road, there's a crown lot between my lots, and they've got a road built right out the center of that lot. And on the east boundary of my property, there is uh, one of their roads built out there. Now, when they run their forwarders, carrying the, the logs and pulpwood off the ground, uh, they'll cut blocks and crown land 1,500 meters deep, and they forward the ground or the wood out to the roads that distance. And yet they want it to take $10,000 off the price of what they were going to offer me for these uh, pieces of ground. $10,000 to build a road into my property and the road wouldn't have to be any more than, you know, if it was 120 meters, it would have been right on my sideline and maybe even less than that. But uh, they wouldn't have built the road. They would have just portered my wood to the roads on either side and there's a road in on the rear of this property up on the crown they could have uh, portered the wood to any of those roads but that was uh, one of the things they had snuck into the small uh, print on the the offer that they made and uh, i wasn't seriously considering the offer it was just they tormented so bad to uh, to offer me a price for cutting these two wood lots and so at last i told them well if you want to do a do an estimate up and tell me how much wood is on the ground and the whole deal go ahead and do it and so included into it was the ten thousand dollar price tag to build a little stub road into my sideline here and uh, no ain't ever happening they're not cutting it and uh, so anyway that's one thing to consider what are you coming in with for machinery what are you coming in with uh, for trucks to move product uh, are you moving christmas trees are you moving saw logs are you moving stud wood uh, are you just using your ground for, you know, enjoyment, personal enjoyment? You want a place to come in and snowshoe or ski or just hike around? Uh, are you just building a camp on the property and you're not going to cut anything? Uh, you know, th those are all factors to take into uh, consideration when you go to build a road. But uh, if you are building a road for trucks, you have got to make sure that you have a solid roadbed. Truckers do not like getting stuck. And if they come in on your ground to haul wood and they're hung up, you know, half a day every time they come in there, they're not going to come and haul for you. I can guarantee you that. Uh, you'll get a bad reputation real quick that you don't have roads for them to haul off of because they've got to keep their machine removing. And so when you're building roads, Consider your layout of uh, of where where you're going to be harvesting from. Now, when they built these old roads years ago, yarding with a horse, you went 75 to 100 paces off of the road, and that's how far you yarded with a horse. And so, on a wood lot like this particular wood lot right here, 660 feet wide, they built a road back the middle, and then they had a few little stub roads off here and there to make it so it was shorter distances for the horses to yard. With a tractor, uh, you can yard a longer distance because your tractor isn't playing out the way the horse would. Uh, the downside is now the price of diesel fuel. So you've got to consider that. Uh, you want to avoid wet places on your ground. If you've got uh, waterways or anything like that, there's limitations of how close you can go to that waterway when you're harvesting. So you build your roads in accordance with that. And uh, if you can avoid uh, steep ground, uh, hillsides and whatnot, that controls erosion and also makes easier access. I know that's not always possible on all properties, but those are all factors that you take into consideration when you're laying out roads on your woodlot. 
a uh, good thing to do today. We've got access to Google Earth, Google Maps, uh, satellite imagery. You can actually look at your block of ground, and you can you know you can look at the uh, not only the satellite image, but you can look at the topographical features. So you can decide where is going to be the best place to put your road, where is going to be the place that uh, uh, is the most convenient for harvest, or you know if it's just access for pleasure. Uh, is there a, a feature on your ground? Do you have a waterway? Do you have a pond? Do you have something that you want to get access to? And so those are all things to take into consideration when you're laying out your roads. But most of all, uh, keep in mind your cost because if you're harvesting wood and taking it out, the cost of building a road can come out of the harvest price. If you're building road onto a piece of ground that's not going to be harvested for a few years, that's a cost that's got to come out of your pocket. And so you look at, uh, do I need, you know, top of the line road that I can drive a 58 foot Winnebago in there, or uh, do I need a road that I can drive in on a farm tractor or an ATV? All things to consider, but most of all, have fun on your ground. It should be enjoyable to you when you go out in the woods and and you're, you know, you're going around, whether you're going for a hike or whether you're going to cut some firewood or whatnot, your ground should be enjoyable to you as the landowner. So that's all I've got today. And uh, I hope you've picked some little nugget of uh, something that's useful to you out of this. Until the next time, stay safe.